in Christ, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because he's like so real in my life. You know? I mean, it's like if you're filled with God, now everybody has God, but everybody doesn't have the Holy Spirit and Jesus in the same in the same way. God is a great he said there's a general revelation of God the Father. You talked about it in Romans 1, right? Yeah. But there's a place where I don't know about accepting Jesus. I, I, I do know that we have to become aware of who he is yeah. and realize he's the one we have to follow. Oh yeah, that's right. Right? It's an awareness. Remember Paul says, uh, he says, when Christ was revealed in me. Yeah. Christ has to be revealed in the human race. Yeah. And when he reveals himself, there's no place else to go. Yeah. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. I, uh, about two, two and a half years ago, I started having like, I, I was reading a lot about what was going on in the Middle East. And it really bothered me, man. It really bothered me what was going on in Iraq, what was going on in Syria, uh, in, in Egypt. I mean, it just, my heart was just aching knowing that all of the people who were being killed, some most, a lot of, mostly Muslims, but a lot of Christians, they're, they had moms, they had dads, they had brothers and sisters, they had children. And all of the pain of the death of a, of a mom or a dad multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. So you hear about someone being killed, but you don't realize that there's hundreds of people involved in that death. And when you're talking about hundreds of thousands of deaths, you're talking about millions of people being involved, of going into abject pain and suffering, losing loved ones to this violent, violent That's spirit, right? right? That's right. When they were fighting over Mosul this last time, I think it was last year, early in the year, they were fighting, they had a big fight over Mosul. Mosul was a very old city, it was divided in half, old city, new city, about a million people. ISIS took over that city. The Iraqi army and Americans went in and fought them house to house, street to street. And Hundreds of thousands of civilians were wounded and injured. I mean, hundreds of thousands. I had a dream. I kept seeing this man walking out of. He, he walks out. I mean, I want to go to Africa. I want to live in Africa. But all of a sudden, I'm talking about the Middle East. This man walks out holding his five-year-old. It looked like a five-year-old son, and the, the child is severely wounded, and he's got a little, you know, turban on. He's he's weeping and he's crying. He goes. Somebody help me! Somebody help me! Somebody help me! And he's holding his son. And I'm going, oh man, I kept seeing this and seeing this and seeing this. I mean, I want to go to Africa, man. I want to go to Rwanda. I want to go to Congo. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm in, in seeing Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing these Muslims. What can I, I don't know. What can I do? What can, yeah. what can I, how can I help? What can I do? Well, you're, you know, you had medical training. You were a medic in the service. Go back, get some medical training, and maybe, maybe and, all right, that's what I'll do. So I go, I go to school over here. I become an, a, an emergency medical technician. It almost killed me. Yeah. I almost, I mean, my blood pressure went up. That school was very hard for me. Oh, and uh, so I got, I, you know, I went, took, got all my certifications and stuff. I got on an airplane, get, and I was going to fly to Beirut, Lebanon. Because I knew I could get into Lebanon, do there, get into Iraq, and maybe Syria. Well, when I got ready to go to Lebanon, all of a sudden, the the uh, prime minister of Lebanon was held hostage in Saudi Arabia, and they shut down the airport in Lebanon. I already had my tickets and stuff. I changed them. I just flew to Amman, Jordan. Yeah. I just got on an airplane and flew to Jordan. I don't even know anybody in Jordan. I don't know why I flew to Jordan. Yeah. I get off the airplane in Amman, Jordan. And I'm going, what am I doing? And I'm on Jordan. I don't even know anybody. I don't speak it. They all speak Arabic. Everybody speaks Arabic. Hardly anybody speaks English. <laughs> Lord, surely there's a reason that I flew to Amman, Jordan. Why am I here in Jordan? And I get this telephone call on my cell phone, right? And it says, it calls from Colorado. Okay. Hello? John? Yeah, this is Alain. Oh, hi, Alain. Alain is a lady I cast a bunch of devils out of about 40 years ago. 
I mean, full on, man. She's never forgot. She stayed in touch with us. She's been friends with us ever since. And uh, she goes, where are you? I said, I'm, I'm in Amman, Jordan. She goes, oh, uh, I said, where are you? In Colorado? She goes, no, man, I'm in Jordan. <laughs> really? She was like that for nine years. Oh, really? I said, really? She goes, want me to come get you? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So Ali drives from southern Jordan, yeah. Aqaba, right there next to Saudi Arabia. She drives from Aqaba to Amman, picks my, I had brought a friend with me, Dale uh, Alter, and uh, she took us on a tour of Jordan. We went to the Dead Sea, man. We went to Mount Nebo where Moses stood on the mountain and looked into the promised land. You know, we looked out into, out into the Jordan Valley. And, you know, I mean, we just all that crazy stuff. We went swimming in the Dead Sea. We went and, and explored uh, old uh, cities that were like, you know, 5,000 years old in the mountains. And I mean, it was just incredible. We finally ended up down in Aqaba. I said, look, I really like sightseeing and stuff, but I didn't come here to sightsee. No. I mean, I need to come, I need to do something here with, with these with these Muslim refugees. Yeah. So she goes, well, here's a phone number. I don't know the guy, but give him a call. Maybe he'll. So I I took a bus from Southern Jordan up to Amman, and I called this pastor. His name is Noor Sawahi. He was a Palestinian, lived in Jordan for the last 25 years. He lived, he was in a city called Mufrik. I said, uh, hi, this is John Land. Oh, okay, that's great, who's John Land? <laughs> I said, uh, uh, can I come over to your place? He, now, he has an outreach. He's ministering to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Muslims. Mm -hmm. And they're coming to Christ by the thousands. Mm -hmm. He has an outreach where he mattresses, pillows, uh, cook stoves, propane, uh, diapers, everything that these people need because they have nothing. And he provides this through his ministry. And he brings an international team from all over the world to work with him in Mufrik, Jordan, right next to the Syrian border. So I took a taxi from Amman to Mufrik. And when we got to Mufrik, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. There's no hotels. Mufrik's a city of a million people. They do not have one hotel in the entire city. They don't have any place. You can't go to Mufford, Jordan and find a place to stay because there is none. Okay. And it's all Islamic and everybody's kind of, it's kind of, if you're in an Islamic city, they're kind of depressed. They're not really a real joyful, happy kind of people. You really. Okay. So I, it's like, I called, I called, I called Nora. I said, Nora, I'm in Mufford. I have no idea where I'm at. I found a lady who was renting an apartment. I saw a sign on an apartment window, and I called that lady, yeah. and she couldn't speak English. I found somebody on the street, some young man, that was willing to talk with her. It turned out to be like her son or something. And she let me stay in that apartment for a night. So she opened up the apartment. So I called Noor, and I said, Noor, I'm in Mufrik, but I don't know where I am. I don't know what part of the, I don't know if I'm, what part of the city I'm in. I don't have any idea where you're at. I said, I'm completely, totally isolated. I don't know what to do. He goes, oh, let me talk to the young man. So when get the kid, he comes back and he's, he says, oh, well, Nora lived about a block away. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is cool. yeah, that's one of the refugee camps in, yeah. near where I was at. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, R-V-I-D-C. <laughs> so Nora comes and picks me up and takes me to his church. They've got... Uh, the next day? <laughs> the next morning, he comes and picks me up. He takes me to his church. And when I got to the church, he has like, uh, they have bunk beds and uh, uh, rooms for people that he brings in international teams from all over the world. Like I was there with a team from Brazil, a team from Germany, a team from uh, Holland. Uh, I mean, all these international teams were there and they're all going out into the Islamic community and going to the homes yeah. And introduced, and they're like bringing supplies to these people that have nothing. Nobody helps them. The United Nations doesn't help them. They get nothing. They don't have enough to live on. And they are making sure they have what they need to live. And they're coming to Christ. Yeah. They said, you want to go to on a house? They call them house visits. I said, you want to go on a house visit? I said, yes, I would like to go on a house visit. Sure. 
So my first house, my first house visit to a Muslim household, I walk in with this with this American guy who had been there for many years, and uh, I said, "Where? What are we doing here?" And she goes, "Well, these people have asked us to come into a Bible study. They're Muslims." Oh, yeah. I said, "Really?" He goes, "Yeah." We come in. Seven women walked out, and each one of them had on uh, hijab, hijab, hijab. Now the burqa is like one they got, you know, it's like yeah. beekeeper thing. I mean, it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, hijab is they just cover every their whole body is covered except their eyes, right? Yeah. They were seven women walk in, all sit down, all completely covered. Mm -hmm. It's I'm all in Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I thought, I, I mean, and this is this is not in my reality about when I what I've learned about Muslims, right? So we we did a Bible study, we talked with them, and find out that they want us to pray for them. We prayed for each one of those women. One of them had just had surgery. A family member was ill. I mean, we laid hands on these ladies and we prayed for them, and it was just powerful, right? Right. And they're coming to Christ by the thousands. Yeah, it's incredible. I went to a conference in Lebanon teaching, uh, this, it was taught by ex-Muslims and Lebanese teachers on how to minister to Muslims. And a lot of them were people who, were, who had been Muslims, they're not Muslims, and telling us the Muslim mindset, what's the difference between you know, Christianity and Islam as far as their understanding of God and stuff? And it was extremely powerful when you start realizing what these people are trapped in. And how profound, how, what a profound thing that they're caught up in. That's it, it, it seeps into every part of their being, right? Yeah. 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 So I left, left I left, I left uh, Jordan, and I knew some. I, I, I had a name of a pastor in Lebanon, in Beirut. So I get on an airplane, and I fly to Beirut, right? And man, since then that whole country has opened up to us. I mean, just incredible. We've been we went in Cyprus, preached in Cyprus. In fact, we're get, we're going to be probably going back to Cyprus. They want to start a ministry over there. But uh, <clears throat> the thing that I'm excited about is you can't be a terrorist if you're a Christian. No, no. It's it's that simple. It doesn't work. It's that simple. Probably right now, there's the, there's the biggest ingathering of Muslims in the world. 21% of Muslims live in the Middle East. The rest of the, the, the rest of the, the, you know, what, 29, 20, 75% uh, live in Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Africa, most Muslims don't live in the Middle East. 20, about 21 percent live in the Middle East. But there's an in there's an in gathering of Muslims worldwide right now that's never it's never happened like this before ever ever. And if you understand the mindset of the Muslim, they don't have an understanding of God the way we do. They don't understand. They don't have the love of God. God does not love them. And they live on a system. Of, of uh, good and evil balances, and they and all the things they do, what, their prayers, their daily prayers, it's all by rote. It's like parents. They don't. A lot of times, they don't even understand the prayers, and they're saying the prayers because it's an obligation, not because they they love God so much, because it's an obligation, and they have to do these obligatory things like Ramadan. They fast on Ramadan. They don't, they don't, I was there for the whole month of Ramadan in May. They don't eat anything during the day, then they gorge themselves at night. I mean, said they said the drugstores, the drugstores sell out with antacids. Oh, yeah. The whole month of rent, <laughs> 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 you know. But uh, they, everything's obligation, and they, they don't have even the good works that they do is obligation. It's nothing's done. It's nothing's done out of, you know, Christians. We are supposedly doing things because we love people, not because we have an ulterior motive. You know, I mean, we love these Muslims because God loves these Muslims, right. and the byproduct is salvation. Right. I don't go after people because I want to get them saved. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> get you saved! <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna love you and love you, and then you're gonna get saved. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love you. I love you. <laughs> God loves you. Yeah. And out of that love, man, salvation pours out. 
Just close. Just close. Nor says, we don't do this because we want anything or because we're, we have an ulterior. We do this because we love them, John. Amen. We just Amen. love them. And the love of God breaks down every, every wall. Breaks every wall. They don't have that in his law. So, so their obligation is, is so they'll have acceptance with Muhammad or, or how is it? What, what Allah, or Allah. Oh, here's the difference between, okay, number one, Allah is, is the word for God. I mean, right. it's what, you know. Now, there is another word in Arabic for God, and I forgot what it is. I wish that I could remember. Uh, but, but it's not used a lot. But usually when you're talking to a, a, to a, a Muslim, Allah, when they, they say Allah, we immediately think, you know, Allah. Yeah. The, but they don't think like that, you know. So it's really and like a lot of the translations. They say Allah for Father God, right? right? The reality is that Allah of Islam is the Moon God. <laughs> I mean, he's the Moon God. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's like uh, when Muhammad consolidated all of the Arab tribes. They were over 900 different gods that they served. And each wow. tribe had their own little gods and stuff. He destroyed all that, consolidated it, and put it all in this black stone that fell from heaven. It's like, you know, they worship that stone. It represents the moon god. So they actually, they they, they say that when, that when they're when they all do when they all do the uh, you know they 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 do the what do they call it when when they all travel to Mecca for for the Hajj. I think they call it the Hajj. They sacrifice so many animals that they say the blood never stops running out of the bottom of the altar. Oh, yeah. Never, because it's a cube. And inside the cube is the stone. They said they kill hundreds of thousands of animals. They slaughter them and the, pour the blood out, and it just never stops running. It's kind of like the way the Jews did in the Old Testament. They do that there now. Like Lois and I were sh raised sheep for 25 years, oh, yeah. and a lot of our sheep we sold to Islamics, and a lot of Islamic meat markets, and they didn't want, they, we couldn't castrate them, we couldn't cut the tails off, all of these restrictions, yeah. you know, for, for the way they, but we're finding that we have established relationships with these Islamics, and we're watching them just by merely serving them and loving them, they're coming into the God, into the kingdom. Amen. And they're getting set, set free. This one gal, we were invited to go to this one home. She just had triplets. And uh, her name is Lena. She was a Islamic Kurd, Syrian <coughs> Kurd from northern, northern Syria. She had triplets. I mean, these were infants. And we, when I first met her, she, these babies were just born, right? right? She didn't have enough money to buy medicine. She didn't have enough money to buy uh, baby formula. Diapers, nothing. If you've got three kids plus a five-year-old daughter, you're living in a 10 by 12 room with your husband, mm -hmm. and all you got is a toilet, it's really hard to get by. You know, they can't go fishing. They can't go plant something. So they are dependent upon people out here. We watched her, over, over a two-month period, we watched her change so radically that we, I walked in her, in her little house one day, and she didn't have any hair dressing on, nothing. And she goes, do you notice anything? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> Just before we left, before Lois left, Lois was with me for a couple of weeks in, in Beirut. Mm -hmm. We get a call, would you please come pray for this lady? Okay, so we made our way through the back streets of Beirut. It really, it's really nasty, parts of it. Some of it is, most a lot of it is. And we go up to her little, this little ground floor room, and we knock on the door. This lady answers. She's, you know, got all her Muslim clothes and stuff on, and she's got six kids in this little room, not even half as big as this room. That's where the whole family lives. Mm -hmm. So, what, what, why did you call for us to come? Because we, I want you to pray for me. Mm -hmm. Well, why? She goes, well, I was. This lady loves Jesus, man. I mean, she just loves Jesus. You can't keep her away from church, but. It's dangerous. She was reading the Bible. Her brother came into the room, caught her reading the Bible, grabbed the Bible, tore it up, lit it on fire in her living room on the floor. Yeah. And told her, if I ever catch you in church or reading the Bible again, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. So she's, so I said, well, 
What do we? What do you want us to? She goes, I just want you to pray for me. And for what? Did I not lose my faith? Yeah. yeah. She didn't say, I want you to pray that my life will be spared, or my. She. I just want you to pray that I would stay strong in Christ and not be afraid, and that I would not lose my faith. Amen. This is Lena. That's that's the courage Lena girls. And the <laughs> So we're some, we're yeah. we're getting donations from friends all over the place, and they're they helping. Us. We're supporting this room, family in several they others. Live in one room with mattress yeah. floor at night. No kitchen, barely anything. Most half the time, the toilets don't even work. You know something? I'm not. I'm Christianity. After 45 years, man, I've been through. I don't know how many revivals. I mean, I've seen. Hey, listen, I've seen things that uh, if I told you some of the stories, you wouldn't believe me. You think that I was exaggerating, or was it? However, however, she, this is when she took her hijab off. After, after all of these years, <laughs> she let a man see my her without Christianity has boiled down to a very simple matter. Yeah. Wow. Find some place to serve and just do it. And just serve. Come on. Stop making excuses. Let's just get up and let's find somebody. It doesn't mean it's what country it is, or if it's your next door neighbor, whatever it is. Whatever. We need to start. If he's agreed to live inside of us and allow us to live in the center of the Godhead, see, we live in the center. Do you understand that your true home is the center of God? It's in the center of the Godhead? Amen. Jesus lives in the center. He's the center of the Godhead. And now you live in him. Amen. How heavy does that get? He's allowed you. He's included you in the Godhead. Yeah. Now, Jesus is God. Yeah. But he's allowed us to be included in who he is. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about who's the boss. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. However, he's given us incredible, incredible blessings, grace, and authority. Yeah. Incredible. You know? We live in the center of God. What a great place to live. And we forget sometimes. I forget sometimes. This is this last two weeks, man. It's, it's been terrible, man. I've been attacked. I've been. I mean, I've been called things that. I mean, I. I, I mean, things that have been said to me the last two weeks that I'm still reeling from. It. Mm -hmm. And I'm going. Mm -hmm. This is right. life, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Christian, man. I don't. Yeah. Good or bad. Yeah. I'm a Christian. Yeah. If I get what I want. I'm still, I, I'm a Christian. If I don't get what I want, I'm still a Christian. If I'm prospering, I'm a Christian. If I'm not prospering, I'm still a Christian. No matter what, we're Christians. Yeah. Well, John, can we ask some questions? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so when you're over there, uh, uh, ministering to the, the Muslim people and to individuals like that lady, is, is are you in danger yourself? No. Well, well, well. Then why? I mean, this this is her her uh, brother evidently, her family was very upset because she was reading the Bible to burn it like that. I mean, I mean, what did they object to your? If they there? caught me, <laughs> <laughs> if they caught us in the house, baby, I don't know. I mean, when she invited us over, obviously she knew he wasn't going to be home, right? Or the husband? So, <laughs> he was part of it. <laughs> can, can you explain a little bit why? The Muslim religion then is so anti-Christ, anti-Christian. Because it's an actual anti-Christ religion. It is. It is. Totally. It's actually an anti it's actually it's actually the definition of anti-Christ. Right. Uh, it can't be more anti-Christ. It's a religion. Okay, like you know, you ever heard of Jack Mormon? Yeah. Jack Mormon. Yeah. A Jack Mormon is somebody. Who says they're a Mormon? But they're they drink born into being a Mormon. They're, you know, they're born in the Mormon family, but they drink Coke. You know, or they do this, or they do that. I mean, it's like they do all the things Mormons aren't supposed to do. Right. Have you ever heard of a of a of a Catholic that probably isn't really a devout Catholic, but yet says they're a Catholic? Yeah. 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 I mean, they may even go to mass uh, on, on Easter or Christmas. Yeah. They're born into the religion. They're born into the religion, and Islam. Is an all-pervading presence in the family, in the Islamic family. Yes, yes. Uh, it's a patriotic, patri uh, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, it's uh, not patriotic. Uh, paternal, paternalistic. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's ruled by men, and women are 
really not that important. Women, yeah. women are to have kids and take care of kids, basically, and yeah. clean the house. That's a lot it. Of, a lot and a lot of kids, they, and they're, they're breeding, right now, the Islamics, they say, even the Imams say, hey, we don't have to worry about fighting you. We're gonna breed you out of existence. Yeah, well, true. Like, I never went in an Islamic household that had less than four children, and many of them had six. Yeah. And they have yeah. they are living on practically nothing. The Lena, the poorest girl that we met. Oh yeah, her husband. They were living. In, yeah, show that this gal here. We were in her home. I mean, her kids get attacked by rats at night. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And we help we help them because people give us money, right? Yeah. We have a, a, comp, a yeah. nonprofit called Christian Outreach Resource Endeavor Core, yeah. and people are just. Every so often we get money in PayPal, it goes into the core account, and it goes straight to these people. Mm -hmm. You know, I see this ad up by Marilyn Hickey saying, yeah. for $5.50, you can send the word of God to the Middle East. And I put a note every time in comments, well, last night you do it for $2.50. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. Amen. Lost, give us the money, we'll do it for $2.50. This family didn't Amen. have a toilet. No toilet for her toilet didn't work, and the yeah. landlord wouldn't fix it. And he said, "If you make me fix it, I'll turn you in." Because they didn't have papers. There was no <coughs> a lot of these people don't have papers; they can't work. They're, 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 they're can't do anything. So, and they're trapped. In other words, they're not citizens. So. No, they're no, no. These are the papers. What do you mean by that? They, the uh, visa. Oh, right. right. You know, they're illegals, oh, basically. They're right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let me give you. Let me give you a little bit of an idea of what we're what we're dealing with here. Yeah, the Lebanon and Jordan. Now, Jordan and Lebanon both have over two million refugees. Right. Okay. Lebanon is seventy miles long and thirty-five miles wide. Yeah. The whole country. Whole country. It's half as big as Israel. Half as big as Israel. The normal population of Lebanon is about four million people. Right. Well, now they have well over two million Syrian refugees. That would, that would be like, uh, we've got 320 million people in the United States. That would be like 100 million people coming over, over the border into America. 100 million. That's the equivalency. Mm -hmm. About the size of, I have a place about the size of Peninsula. Yeah, it's not much bigger. The whole country is not much bigger than from San Jose to Napa. Probably not really welcome then. Okay, another fact about Lebanon. In 1980, from 79 to 84, there was a great war because the Palestinians, Yasser Arafat, set up his headquarters in Beirut. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty much. 